Good morning, Ms. Trek. Thank you for taking part at uh, this series of interviews focusing on challenges and opportunities related to emission reductions rights in the context of jurisdictional red plus. Before we actually start, uh, can you please introduce yourself? I'm glad to be here first. Um, my name is Charlotte Streck and I'm the Director of Climate Focus by training a biologist and a lawyer. Um, Climate Focus is turning 18 years today. Um, so we are grown up team of advisors. But before this, I was a senior legal counsel with the World Bank's uh, legal department and focusing on, um, on climate change and carbon finance. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Well, as we all know, you have an extensive experience in dealing with the emission reductions rights or carbon rights in all its forms and shapes. Uh, and you are the author of several publications related to the subject. So how does the topic of emission reductions rights currently present itself in your work? Well, let's say the, the question um, on what is a carbon right? Who holds the right to an emission reduction or removal? What is an emission reduction right, uh, emission reduction or removal legally? Dates back to the very, very first, you know, carbon transaction. So we go 25 years ago when we first, you know, started ourselves the question, what is it what we are transacting out? In particular, if we're transacting this outside of a regulatory regime, which in many cases, you know, the voluntary carbon market lacks. It has a private standard that regulates to a certain extent uh, the rules of the game. But of course, it, it's not anchored in any kind of regulation that defines what is uh, an emission reduction, what is being transacted, what's the like, legal nature of, of that thing, that asset, that service, that instrument that is being transacted. In that sense, the question on carbon right has been with the carbon markets and has been with me for well over 20 years. Um, it has always been an issue and continues to be an issue also in, in non-forest and non-nature-based solutions. So it is also relevant to establish car carbon rights in the context of wind farms or waste projects or any kind of other carbon project. However, it never has been as controversial and as problematic as the, in the case of nature-based solutions where you have a lot of overlapping rights and, and the, the question on who can benefit from a carbon transaction is much more complex and salient. So coming back to your question, um, it has been this question, what is a carbon right and what is a forest carbon right, um, has never left me in the last 20 years. But of course now with um, a more, let's say a more uh, nuanced and uh, set of instruments in carbon markets ranging from Article 6 and domestic legal, so international law regulation, domestic regulation, and voluntary carbon transactions in the you know in the context of private contract law, um, it is again one of the main issues that is relevant for carbon transactions. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and in, in line with with um, what you just mentioned, um, can you please tell us how does the different types of carbon rights um, can be actually categorized? or how the various rights related to this intangible asset or service can be uh, disentangled uh, as we focus on, on the forest sector. Yeah, and maybe it's it's important to take a step, ba a step back and say carbon right is not a defined term. So carbon rights per se, you know, it doesn't, is, is, there is no agreement what it means. It is essentially, defining a bundle of rights which different people and different lawyers and different lawmakers interpret in different ways. Um, a bundle of right that relates to be being able to monetize emission reductions and removals or having a right to benefit if somebody else monetizes these emission reductions or removals 
from this transaction. So in essence, it tries to capture the entitlement that comes with, you know, there is some, some transaction that benefits from an activity that increases the storage of carbon in biomass or that reduces the emissions. And a community, a person, a private entity has established as claims the right to benefit bit from it. So, um, and that is, it's important that often this claim comes before such right is legally defined or construed. So often the, the right, the identification of the right follows a bit the claim. You think, okay, you know, we have a number of people that manage land or own land or own a certain property of a land like the timber or the fruits of the land and for that reason claims to have a right on being part of the carbon transaction and hence we need to find to have find a way to define this right so that this group of people or that person benefits from the carbon now i think it is also important and that's that is essential because, of course, you know, it has a core legal part. The question who holds a right to carbon transactions and to benefit from these carbon transactions, but it has also one of um, equity and fairness. So it has one that is absolutely essential um, in even if it is not a legally construed right, or even if it is difficult to make the case, you know, as you know, a proper legal scholar through a proper legal argument. In many cases, um, it is important that people that occupy the land in some way are considered to make sure that the carbon transaction is fair and equitable. But you know, we also need to. I think we also yet again need to take a step back and say what we talk. So we have also different diff different transactions that lead. To different conclusions here because if a government makes a transaction under international law then the rules are very different uh, when it comes to benefiting from an asset that is defined under international law as you know anything for example under article 6 of the paris agreement uh, or in the context of um, a, a world bank contract so that is different from a private transaction, which is governed by private contract law. And that can be between two persons. It can be between a community and a person, but it also can involve, um, it can involve funds or actors or governments. Governments, if they act outside of international law, can also act under normal you know, contract law. So um, there is, for example, there is certainly a difference in the contract for lawyers between an FCPF or an Article 6 transaction and um, a LEAF transaction, which is, you know, a transaction governed or, you know, organized under, falling under, under private law, you know, whatever jurisdiction they choose, which I don't know. Indeed, you, as we refer to Article 6, actually, um, its implementation under the Paris Agreement, uh, as we know, introduces uh, new considerations for rights related to carbon credits. Um, how may this new context and the decisions that government may take uh, affect, in your view, ma market actors in relation to the generation ownership or, or use of, of carbon credits? So the Paris Agreement um obliged all countries to report on progress towards a national determined contribution and in this context they also need to report on on progress towards their mitigation and adaptation but in our case i think it's more relevant their mitigation targets so in that they are now while we had before the paris agreement we of course had already an accounting regime which applied to the Annex One parties of the Kyoto Protocol. So in, uh, in the developed countries that were a part of this group of Annex One countries, they were well you know, used to account economy-wide for their emissions and have carbon markets underneath. 
But in, in the case of developing countries, it's sort of a, a novelty that one has to account for all the emission reductions and then in that context implements or engaged in Article 6 and has to consider consider the export of emission reductions or the accounting of emission reductions in the context of the Paris agreements in the sense that if I, as a country, issue an authorization that this emission reduction can be used towards another international target, um, an NDC or Corsia, then I need, you know, I need to export this and need to invest in another emission reduction in order to meet my NDC. So it is not any longer without implications for developing countries to transfer these emission reductions. However, it is also important that, of course, and that's, you know, that it's very deliberately regulated in the Article 6 or in the Paris rule book, book that the governments don't have to issue such authorization. Because, of course, um, it is also generally the sense that developing countries should benefit from carbon finance. And if they export then all their rights to account for these benefits, you know, in 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 turn for you know for getting money, they put the 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 NDC achievement at risk, which is not necessarily you know what the international community wants. So it's not the idea that we see or find ourselves in twenty twenty five, and we have carbon finance you know that has flown from the global north more generally to the global south more generally, but we find now you know. Um, and, and a good number of developing countries not in compliance with the NDC. So that would be a very undesired outcome. In that sense, I find it always, I find I'm still racking my head around this whole discussion to which extent these rules of Article 6 should apply in an analog fashion to voluntary carbon markets. Because, of course, the way how they have been designed is within the system. So they are absolutely, you know, logical in the context of making sure that there is transparent and accurate NDC accounting. Um, the fact that now it is being, you know, asked that these corresponding adjustments or the bookkeeping would also apply to voluntary carbon market is is not something that is obvious. So it is often presented in a way, but it's not. You know, we apply something from one legal system to something completely different, both in terms of legal system as well as an accounting system. So we have one accounting system and we have another accounting system. We have one legal system and another legal system. And we apply now pretend that we can just carry this over, this idea of the corresponding adjustments to um to this other accounting system on the voluntary carbon market and make it better in a certain way. And I, and that we also, that we th say now that there should be no double counting between an NDC and an, and a corporate uh, a climate goal, which has some merits. I'm not saying that it has not, but it only has merits if the NDC is ambitious. So I'm now, you know, if you remember, and I'm not sure whether many of your listeners are still, you know, um, aware in the Kyoto Protocol time, we had also, we had countries with more tar stringent targets and we had a lot of hot air in the system, meaning we had a number of countries that had a lot of over allocations of emission rights. Now, if you have an over allocation of emission rights, the transfer of this emission right doesn't lead to additional uh, mitigation because there was no mitigation in the place where you had an over allocation, hence you don't, you know, you use it as an offset and it is even undermining the system. Big problem in the in the Kyoto Protocol with respect to Eastern Europe and the Russian Federation. Now the same applies here. So a corresponding adjustment is only valuable if it is linked to an ambitious, ambitious NDC. If it is linked to a very inflated NBC, NBC, NDC, NDC, it doesn't lead to additional emission reduction. It is also not environmentally particular credible and doesn't add credibility to the credit that it is attached to the emission reduction that it is being attached. Hence, we need to be careful that by this call for corresponding adjustment, we do not reward countries with not ambition, ambitious NDCs, because countries with more ambitious NDCs will be a lot more hesitant to, you know, to approve corresponding adjustment. All this is a bit, you know, it is all 
you know, a bit complicated and I'm not sure how how many countries already have fully developed a view on the implication, um, but I think that is of the implications of ambitious NDCs, corresponding adjustments and what it means for different sectors and mitigation costs in the and this is particularly relevant for the forest sector because it is often said that the land sector generates cheap um, emission reductions, but everybody who works in the land sector knows that that's not true, but it is still the perspective. So um, I'm calling for, you know, that all countries are carefully evaluating their positions before they approve any kind of uses of um, emission reductions that then do not forward don't count against their NDC. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Just to conclude, would you like to, to share any lessons learned uh, as it concerns the role or participation of the private sector in particular in red plus jurisdictional schemes and how emission reductions rights can be allocated? Um, I think it is the, the sovereign decision of a country to decide on how the private sector should participate in, in jurisdictional or other you know, schemes. Um, this depends on a number of things. It depends on you know, who is on the land, who owns the land, um, you know, how is it in this particular legal system, how how can land use be constrained or should be constrained, but also to which extent the country wants to benefit from finance directly flowing, you know, in form of foreign direct investment directly flowing to the land sector and particular, you know, local programs or projects. I do not think that this is necessarily making jurisdictional programs impossible. I think they can both coexist. Um, they can coexist through nesting um, of different you know, activities. But, and, and this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a certain complication, but I think it is feasible at the moment when countries already have a good accounting system, which they need if they engage in jurisdictional programs, um, they can also um, make provisions to deduct um, emission reductions that are allocated to the private sector under this system. But I wanted to just one last thing say, because I it's an equity concern that is also, you know, I think important to consider also that um, under the Kyoto Protocol, again, and until today, um, developed countries hardly have done this. They have, so if I look here in Germany, of course, Germany has ben benefits in its accounting system from an increase in forest cover. So it accounts for it and it reports you know, on this increase and it take claims all the benefit. Um, forest owners that are, you know, are not participating in this. Um, because it is under the system if if um, if there is the government if that the government within existing laws doesn't constrain the land use it doesn't need to you know it doesn't take anything from the forest owners it doesn't give anything it creates incentives but at the end it claims the full benefit um, under the the uh, under its NDC or previously under the Annex One accounting. In the context of the Kyoto Protocol, nonetheless, of course, private actor can engage in carbon market projects here. Um, it just wouldn't get any kind of corresponding adjustments or consideration here um, by the government. So I'm just saying that this is at the end, you know, it is a decision of, of the host countries and they have full sovereign decision and and shouldn't you know should should exercise that that sovereignty to the best of all the communities in their country thank you very much charlotte for your very comprehensive uh, comprehensive answers it has been really a pleasure having you um part of this yeah. group and uh, hopefully we'll have other opportunities to collaborate in the future thank you very much it has been my utmost pleasure <laughs> <laughs>